Good evening, everyone, to our Board of Education meeting. If we could all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're gonna start this evening with a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. That passes. Next, we need a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting minutes for August 6, 2020. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. Next, we need a motion to approve Board of Education work session minutes for August 12th, 2020. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. Next, we have patron comments and our board secretary, Janet Sadowski, will be reading our board, uh, the patron comments tonight. Janet. Okay, there's 25 comments. So I'm just gonna start with comment number one. It's coming in from Dawn Wind. And her comment is, please follow the guidelines of the CDC and provide in-person schooling for the students in Rockwood. My husband and I have returned to work since early May and are able to do so with COVID protocols and procedures. Our children are now facing the task of becoming their own parents and teachers for 40 hours per week, and it is not indicated. People are living their lives outside of schools and not dying in massive numbers as your plan seems to indicate. Our students are suffering emotionally as well as academically. Uh, thank you, Dawn Wind. Comment number two come, is from Matt Skaggs. Dear Rockwood School Board, my name is Matt Skaggs. I'm a single father of three kids, a former senior at Lafayette who had her senior year taken away because of the requirements to isolate due to COVID, an incoming freshman to Lafayette and a fifth grader at Babbler. The CDC director said he would send his grandkids back to school. The CDC is recommending the kids go back to school, yet we are listening to Sam Page, a politician in his controlled St. Louis Health Department. No numbers have been given to when this isolation of our kids will be lifted. Dr. Garza of the St. Louis Metro Pandemic Task Force said that the goal was to be at or below 40 new hospitalizations for the seven day average. We have been right around that number and as of yesterday, that number is 40. The goal of isolation was to flatten the curve to make sure our hospitals were not overwhelmed. In April, the hospital had as many as 500 people under their care, which is no more than 5% capacity at our hospital beds. Currently, we have 273 in the hospital up from isolation, yet almost half of when this first started. We are currently using 9% of our ICU beds for COVID patients, which no way can say what would overwhelm the system because of other needs for the beds. It's not 9%, that is for sure. The statistics show zero deaths in Missouri from COVID-19 in the age group of 19 and under. 8,246 positive cases in that age range with zero fatalities. Then when we get to the teachers, teachers age 20 to 49, the Missouri 40, in Missouri, 40,597 positive cases in that age group uh, of which 47 deaths. That is 0.115% mortality rate from positive cases in Missouri, not excluding pre-existing conditions. We know the teachers union is using this as a political play against the current president. How do we know this the teachers are telling us they have told us that union that the union is has asked them to reach out to the good parents to get them on their side they have been told to get out of teaching if they don't vote for biden you as the employer have the right to demand they get back to work in person with kids they can decide not to they can decide to strike they can do what they want but right now you are not doing what is right for our children the data is there we have been told that Governor Parsons hold the power to get the kids back in school. His office is denying that and they have pushed us to the Department of Education. 
you as the board and as the employer must demand that by next quarter our teachers are teaching our kids in schools. Our kids desire better than what they are getting. My kids' health and mental well-being is being jeopardized, and if you believe our kids are going to keep up with St. Charles County or the private schools, you are sadly mistaken. If you need to help figuring out how to get kids back in school, there are so many resources available. This is on you, not the health department, not the governor, not the teachers. You are the employer and we are the customers. And that's the end of that three minute time. Comment number three is from Melissa Fruschella. My name is Melissa Fruschella and I have three sons. My oldest, Max, just graduated from Lafayette and is attending the University of Missouri studying finance. My middle son, Sam, will be a junior at Lafayette and my youngest son, Giovanni, will be a freshman at Lafayette. I'm writing this email because I feel that these kids need to be in school, not just for their academic well-being, but for their social, physical, and emotional well-being. When Lafayette went to virtual learning in the spring, it was a complete and utter failure for my two younger boys. I am completely aware of the circumstances that led to that decision and in no way criticizing the school district or the teachers. It was unforeseen and we all tried to make it work, but it did not. Trying to figure out the assignments for the boys, what they were, when they were due was absolutely brutal. My husband and I did everything we could do to keep the boys on track, but it was shocking how quickly they checked out on school. Learning sitting in front of a computer all day will not work for my family. My children need to be with other children and learn what they need to learn in person. I'm asking the board what I can personally do to get these kids back in the classroom. One of my biggest issues is that there is there that there do not seem to be any benchmarks or goals that need to be achieved in order to resume in-person learning. The virus is not going away. We need to be vigilant and make good choices. However, completely isolating these children with virtual learning will have far more negative effects than sending them to school. There are always risks, but life is full of risks. Respectfully, Melissa Fuchello. Um, number four is from Amber Mueller. The purpose of my comment tonight is to again request in-school learning for all district children. To this point, there has been no specific data on why our in-person learning plan was canceled and we have not yet been given benchmarks for return. My generic phrase of what is safest and we'll reassess at the term one or, or two end is not an acceptable or accountable response to the district parents and taxpayers. An in-school return plan can be safely formulated and as an inspiration, I would refer you to the study what the Fort Zumwalt superintendent and board are planning for their school reentry and safety protocol for when COVID affects their buildings. My pediatrician is the physician task force is on the physician task force advising local superintendents like you, local health and government committees, and she told me that their data and recommendations are falling on deaf ears. She told me kids are not dying from COVID. They are not transmitting it to each other or adults. They are not overwhelmed with COVID. You know what their medical practices are unindated with. Depression, anxiety, obesity, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, starvation, runaways, online predatory behavior. Children are suffering. Their education will suffer. Please understand this. I challenge you not to let the teachers union silence what is right and allow this to be political using our children as pawns. I challenge you not to be scared of what the media will say about Rockwood as fear sells the media arena. 74.25% of Rockwood parents want to go back, would sign waivers. We don't expect you to guarantee they won't get COVID. It's okay, it's school, sicknesses and viruses are everywhere. And the good news is 99.9% .9 of people will survive COVID and we will support you through this. Please believe that you will have the parental and community support in returning back to school. No matter how you cut it, there will be people that are unhappy. You are in the impossible situation. I understand and empathize, but I care more about my children and how this will affect them educationally, mentally, and socially for the long term. I will continue to speak up for them and encourage them to advocate for their future as well. Respectfully, Amber Mueller, parent of three children in Rockwood. The fifth patron comment, to whom it may concern, I am heart broken seeing back to school pictures. I'm heartbroken that two out of three of my children cried when I told them they would stay home and do virtual. 
My youngest only experienced half of kindergarten and loves just being with me, so she doesn't totally get it. I'm disappointed and discouraged about the hours of virtual learning my first grader, third, and sixth graders will do. They aren't allowed that amount of technology on a daily basis in our house. I can't even wrap my brain around it. I think that think about the depression and suicidal issues these middle school and high school students are facing. I'm thankful for teachers who want to run to school. I find it hard to believe that everyone believed the CDC at the beginning of COVID, but ignored the recommendations now. Our children need school for educational, emotional, social, and psychological reasons. Be the voice of Rockwood kids. Don't allow politics, teachers, unions to be the voice. Virtual parents got what they wanted with five-day virtual. School parents deserve the same. Take a stand. There are many that will support you. Thank you, uh, Rachel McClung. Number six, my name is Dave Deb Michaels. I have a seventh grader and a ninth grader this year. I have attended the last two board meetings. I have emailed Dr. Miles, board members, and Shelly Willott several times with questions and comments. First, I want to thank you again for all the time and attention all of you are giving to the school year. I know it has not been easy. I also want to let you know that my ninth grader and I were relieved to see the virtual plan Zoom schedule does somewhat mimic a typical school day. We are unfortunately part of the statistics of teens diagnosed with anxiety and depression due to the isolation these last several months. We were desperate for the schedule, a routine, and more life learning than was originally noted in the other plans. We are hopeful the district's daily schedule will help. Ultimately, what will be the best for our family, though, is to be back at school in person. Secondly, I want to address the teacher shortages as it relates to the inability to do any in-person school days. I am among many parents who are confused as to why this was not anticipated and therefore not avoided. I ask that you now come up with solutions to this issue, not limited to number one, hiring additional teachers to teach in the classroom. Number two, allowing current teachers to teach from home and zoom into classes of school kids at school with volunteers as staff to manage behavior. Or number three, do you want needs to do what needs to be done to allow students to view a live class in session at school, whether through Zoom in, in real time or recorded, not to be watched later. I realize it is extra work for the teachers to occasionally have live and virtual students, but teachers at other schools are doing it. The idea is that if virtual kids can watch what kids in person do, that it will enable the district to not need separate teachers to teach the virtual students not have to record so many videos and enable the district to not need additional teachers just for virtual as well as teachers in person. The number of teachers we still need is smaller. Maybe that will help get us in the classroom sooner. Please note local private schools such as Westminster are having students join a live class through Zoom as well as using Canvas. I was told by the school that students don't, students don't have to Zoom in for every class. Maybe they join for tests or days that students give presentations, et cetera. Frankly, if we simply recorded our live class sessions as we will be doing now with a virtual plan, the students could even watch them later as opposed to joining by Zoom. This way we'd have kids in person at school and we'd also have kids who need to be at home at home. Westminster is offering five days in person and five days virtual. I know we are bigger than Westminster, but we also have more resources. If there are privacy or other obstacles to this, please let us know so we can work with the right people to come up with solutions. These are unprecedented times and thinking outside the box is warranted. If equipment or money is the obstacle for Rockwood, please let parents know how much and give us a chance to donate to get what's needed. We are gravely concerned that if efforts to fix the problems cause the teacher shortage aren't started now, there will be no chance to get kids back to school in person this school year or even longer. Thank you for reading, Deb Michaels. Patron num comment number seven, the purpose for my comment tonight is to support getting my kids back in school and to ask for some information surrounding your de decision to go virtual. An overwhelming majority of the parents want their kids back in school. This is where the kids need to be to, to get the best education. Keeping them out of school is not going to get them the quality of education that they deserve. 74% of the parents surveyed said they wanted the kids in school, so why only the small 26% and not the majority? It has been said that the decision for all virtual was made for a safety of teachers and students. However, if you look at the true facts and not the skewed data that is only out there to spread fear, you will see that it is safe to return to school. 
students are suffering from anxiety, depression, abuse, and so much more. How can you keep schools closed when far more kids die from the virus, viruses like the flu? We cannot live in fear because this is not living. Rockwood School District also cannot make decisions based in fear of the media. If students should contact COVID-19, we can't keep our kids out of schools and deny them their education because we are afraid of the media who pushes fear as their agenda and isn't afraid to lie. Kids aren't dying from this virus. If you go, if you are going to be keeping kids home, then parents need to be informed as if they are the teacher. We need lesson plans and resources to be able to support and enrich our kids' learning since essentially we are the teachers now. We send out the full curriculum so we can see what our kids are expected to learn. This, may, this way we can help keep them on track and hold them accountable. Otherwise they will be behind and then how will we ever make that up? Parents need informed answers as to why this is happening. When our, parent, our planning gets kids back into schools, what are the guidelines for this? You can't continue to remain silent where kids can, while our kids continue to be negatively impacted by this. Parents like me who want their kids in school aren't going anywhere. We will continue to insist that our kids are educated in person until it actually happens. I know your decision isn't easy. However, sometimes the best decisions are the hardest to make. I promise you that if you put our kids back in school now, you will have the support of the 74% of the families who want their children back in school. Thank you for your time, Colette Nicholson. Patron comment number eight, I'm an 86 year old man who, who has lived in the Rockwood School District for 33 years and have grandchildren going to Rockwood. I know that those serving on the RSD Board of Education are giving up their time to provide the very best in education for the students in Rockwood. But virtual education has been shown not to prove, provide an adequate education for students grade 12 and below. Parents are desperately trying many avenues to bypass any inadequate virtual education being forced on them by Rockwood. They are trying to move their children to other schools, other school districts, homeschooling, et cetera. None of these are truly adequate to provide an even flow of education to their children and they will cost money. Much of the curriculum needed to be planned with a smooth flow from K to 12. Students working toward a scholarship may miss the opportunity to develop and show their capabilities. There are many other negatives that I will not bother listing here. Parents are faced with an impossible, impossible situation. All of us in RSD are forced to pay a large amount of tax to, to Rockwood School District. Many parents do not have enough extra money to pay for an alternate education, and the money we pay to Rockwood is not providing adequate education. I am going to at least protest my large payment to Rockwood School District. Sincerely, Robert Goebel. Patron comments 9, 12, and 14 all have a passage in them that is the exact same passage. So I'm going to read that once for all three of these comments. Um, and it goes, first day of freshman year is not supposed to be this way. It's not. You can spare me the cute, we're all in this together taglines because I'm not buying it. Not for a single second. We're not in this together. We are more divided than ever. Guess who is feeling it without the ability to articulate it? Guess who is suffering? Guess who has to go along with whatever we throw at them? Guess who has had to adapt to change after change after change? Guess who has no, guess who has no say in anything? Guess who has had the bottom drop out of all the things they look forward to, all the things they are passionate about, all the things outside their family that make them feel included and seen and connected and alive, our children. Our children have traded in person, in person school for a camera in their bedroom all day long. They have traded, please don't call me, call on me for a camera in their face, making them more self-conscious than ever. And a teacher constantly reminding them that it is the policy they stay on screen or they are marked absent. They had traded in person, in person comfortable introductions for even more uncomfortable recording selfies introductions that are cringy and awkward and on display for all to see. They have traded their teacher smile for teachers in empty classrooms with masks on. They have traded books for apps and pencils and papers for iPads. They have traded group projects for group chats and hall passes for pause screens. They have traded everything that feels socially natural and innate for forced disconnect and distancing. They have traded hope for fear. In the spring, we said it's just the end of the school year. Most of them will get checked out anyway. It's graduation, no biggie, they will be fine. It's just prom, maybe we can do something later. 
it's just their eighth grade or senior class trip or last month ever in college. Hey, people are dying, are dying, sacrifices need to be made. We need to flatten that curve, greater good, 15 days to the slow spread, they'll all understand. That curve is flat, but here we are 160-ish days later, no homecoming, no in-person school, no sports, no meaning no scholarships for some, no clubs, no proper accommodations or supports for special education students, no first aid jitters, no new experiences, no new friends, no real connection, no hope, nothing to look forward to. We are failing them. We are failing them because we don't even know how to process any of this ourselves. We are failing them because we have allowed fear to lead. We are failing them because we are too afraid to admit just how much we have overestimated their ability to roll with these impossible punches. I'm sick to death of hearing how resilient our kids are. I'm sick of trying to throw flowers on a pile and pretending it doesn't stink. I'm sick of taking things away, giving them back, and then taking them away again. I'm sick of listening to people use our kids as props to push their agendas. Our children are not okay. We need to figure that out. We need to support them. So this was turned in by Laura and Kirk Richmeyer, Jean Billsland, and Megan King. And they all have other comments on their um, patron comments that are all available on the um, board docs under comment number nine, number 12, and number 14, if you're interested in reading those. Patron comment number 10. Hi, how will 504s be addressed? My son has a hard time focusing and sitting in front of a computer is not going to be easy to keep his focus. Will dances and other social events happen? Will there be another survey for teachers before the next quarter to see if they are willing to return? Thanks from Ashley Brennan. Patron comment, comment number 11. Thank you for receiving all these emails on behalf of concerned parents. My concern is that the NEA, after viewing their Facebook page, has bullied the teachers and the board into making poor choices for our students. They have a very clear political agenda. It's time to give the teachers a choice to return to work or to find another job. Other schools are open and doctors are figuring out what is needed to treat this virus. Time to stop playing politics. That, that's from Madonna Griesmeyer. Board comment number 13. Good evening. I want to thank you all for the time to hear me. This year we will have two high school students, a freshman and a sophomore at Summit. To say we are disappointed in how this school year is being approached would be an understatement. My freshman will not get the opportunity to know what high school is about. She has a very clear plan of what she wants to do. She wants to join the military and become a surgeon. We have talked with the recruiter and have mapped out her plan. She needs to obtain a 3.8 to achieve her goals. I do not feel confident that being homeschooled by her parents is going to get her to, to her goals. I'm not a teacher and my husband is not a teacher. We both work full-time jobs to afford our children the opportunity to attend a Rockwood education. I can't be convinced that this online version of school is what my children need or deserve. We moved to the district two years ago in preparation for high school. Our children are being robbed of not only their childhood, but their education. I'm not sure how this quarter plan is supposed to work. My sophomore was so excited to sign up for the geometry and construction class that sure looks different now through a computer. My sophomore is the type of student that needs face-to-face -face instruction. She is already defeated for the year and we have not even started. I don't see how your quarter plan allows for students to come back this year at all. I feel this year is done before it begins. And if 52% of the teachers are not willing to come back, how do you how do you staff schools of the COVID numbers do hit where they need to? I feel we are not being told the truth about the rest of the year. We what exactly are the magic numbers in order for our kids and their to get their education back? I find it very insulting to send out surveys to families, get an overwhelming high response to a question and turn around and do the complete opposite. I don't feel like you listen to us at all. It's up to the board members and Dr. Miles and that is all. So why send our surveys at all? Why send out surveys at all? Have you thought about the repercussions of our children's mental health? What is isolation is doing to them? I don't think this is being taken serious enough. Families are having to quit their jobs to stay home with their children. Single parents are frantically trying to decide what to do. Let's be honest, most can't afford the outrageous $1,000 a month for Adventure Club. 
Adventure Club sounds a lot like school to me, just being paid for. I don't understand the reasoning behind being able to do that and not school. I guess it all comes down to the teachers not willing to come back. I wish we could have done, have had more time to map out a plan. We could have returned to a private school. This is how we envisioned our, this is not how we envisioned our children getting an education. Thank you from Katie and Joe Gibbs. Patron comment number 15 to the Rockwood Board of Directors. I recognize that all of you are in an incredibly difficult position and want to thank you for your service. Don't we all miss the days when the biggest issue were lunch tables and junior Falcon basketball teams? Nonetheless, I'm writing today to express my huge disappointment in Rockwood not offering five days in person, which is what our taxes are supposed to provide. I'm incredibly disappointed and sad for my daughter who's a senior at Rockwood Summit. Did you consider the mental and emotional impact of these students? There are more suicide deaths than COVID deaths for teenagers. I'm concerned about the quality of the education, especially given how poor it was in the spring. I don't understand how the quarter system will work. What about classes that build on one another? My son has a foreign language that he will only have in the first quarter and then again in the third and fourth quarter. I can't see that being productive. I'm also concerned about lab work in a class like chemistry. Has Rockwood considered opening up the science labs for these kids to do on-site experiments? It seems like this could be done in small groups in a socially responsible manner in order for kids to get the education that they need and deserve. Could they use the Monday mornings for this? Otherwise, these hands-on classes will be wasted. What will be done with the final schedule? Will they have finals in October after the first quarter? Are you planning for a, a way for the sophomores to take the ACT at school? If you start planning now, you can set up responsible social distance way that for these kids to take the ACT as scheduled in the spring. And finally, I want to ask you let ask you to let the kids play sports. Even if St. Louis County continues with their unreasonable restrictions, there are at least some sports that can go on. Let the kids play tennis, golf, cross country, even soccer, volleyball, softball, baseball, and field hockey. These are low contact sports that can be played easily and responsibly. Let the parents choose if they will allow their kids to play. Don't make the decision for them. Practices and games can be moved outside of St. Louis County like all the club teams are doing now. Thank you for your time and reviewing my com comments. I look forward to hearing some answers. Sincerely, Lori Schreiner. Patron comment number 16, Rockwood School Board and Administrators. The old adage claims it takes a village to raise a child. This has been our guiding principle as we have navigated raising a son with special needs. It is now apparent that this also applies to our typically developed daughter. With a typically developed child, these things come naturally in community made up of friends, family, teachers, and the greater community. This village works as our wheels on the cart and our precious cargo of our children are, are in this moving cart. As parents, we continually try to make sure that all the wheels stay in the cart, are moving in the same direction and provide oil to the squeaky wheels. With your decision to go back to online learning that we are assigned in, in the spring, you, are diminished, you have diminished the capability of two of our wheels. In the spring, teachers were not as effective and the relationships our students were building with peers vanished into a two-dimensional world. Since spring, most of the, the Rockwood families have been carrying the load and relied on family, on family to accomplish what the other two wheels normally carry. The fourth wheel of the greater community has also been limited as we try to keep our kids home and limit community exposure. This boils down to a great injustice for our kids in the way of large regressions in learning and enormous strain on the family unit and isolation of our ch children. All four wheels need to be moving in the same direction. It takes all of the support, which our children are accustomed to, to keep our children moving forward in education, relationships, and overall healthy lives. Our son that has Down syndrome will inevitably regress without his proper supports in place. The Zoom meetings in the spring were great for him to continue to see his teachers, therapists, and friends' faces. However, he needs practice with social interactions with these people. That cannot be practiced over a Zoom call. I find Zoom calls difficult to navigate, people talking over one another. You cannot read people's expressions as well. I cannot imagine what it is like for our son who struggles with these issues to begin with. Our daughter will certainly regress in her education as well. Her teachers did a wonderful job with assignments and she was very busy with schoolwork in the spring. However, we feel that we much of the instruction was not fully learned as it just became about completing tasks that were assigned. Only one teacher gave online lectures about the material. With the other classes, it had to be self-taught. 
I challenged the Rockwood School Board and administrators to get more creative and find a way to get our children back to school. We have always prided ourselves in being part of the Rockwood community because that meant wonderful schools with amazing teachers and top-notch education. Right now, Rockwood is failing its families in the greater community in which it serves. As we move forward, please consider the fact that you are not giving families a choice. I want I want the choice to send my children back into the school environment. You need to work harder to come up with a plan where every family has a choice. Thank you for your time, Scott and Jennifer Ensley. Patron comment number 17. Hello, I'm a parent of five kids currently in the Rockwood School District. I have two at EHS and three at Blevins. This comment and question is regarding my three at Blevins. All three of my kids at Blevins have an IEP. While I know that all IEP matters will be addressed virtually as the rest of their classes, how does this district plan out, plan out laying out how to schedule these services? My husband and I both work full time out of our out of the house, and while I can remote some of the time, I have to be readily accessible via phone, computer, email, etc., and therefore can't necessarily sit with my kids throughout their virtual classes. I have one day per week I can work remote Wednesdays, and my husband sometimes has Thursdays and Fridays off. But Mondays and Tuesdays, my three kids at Bluff at Blevins will not be able to regularly participate in the Zooms, class meetings, et cetera. We do have that financial resources to, uh, we do have that financial resources to the three kids be taught outside of the home, such as a nanny or daycare. I'm concerned that my three kids will be left regressing in their individual areas addressed by the IAP as a result of not being able to make the services as scheduled by the schools without any parental agreement on the time set. I understand teachers have families also, but I feel as if the families are the main persons being asked to rearrange their livelihoods to make the work while the livelihoods of the teachers are pretty much the same. They have the same hours, same days, et cetera. Is there anything in place that will require teachers to assist those families like mine during evenings and weekends since we aren't afforded the same comforts? I will have to spend evenings going through recorded Zooms with three kids after working eight to nine hours per day and will not have access to teachers to help during those times other than submitting an email and waiting for a response that might take one to two days to come back. My fifth grader has already shown signs of regression with his speech and my kindergartner is on an IAP for social emotional, which means getting her to even come close to participating in Zooms without me sitting right there with her is not a reasonable expectation. So she is already looking at coming severely behind with no support during the times of the days when it will be suitable for our family. I know we are not the only family in the same boat either. I know this is the worst comment question, but I will also feel, but I also feel because of the amount of families in the same boat that this is something that should be addressed. I respect teachers and what they do every day for kids, but at the same time, I am a parent. I also feel these circumstances that if teachers are receiving their full pay to be teachers to their entire class, then they should be avail available during the evening and weekend hours so all the kids in the class have the same advantage in this situation. Thank you for your time with this. This was sent by Christina Delergio. Board comment number 18. The purpose of my comment is to request in school learning for district children, can you please provide us metrics for when it's going to be safe for our kids to receive in school instruction? 74% of the families responded to the survey wanted in school learning, and without any concrete data, we have been denied that option. Denied and without any guidelines for return. Generic BOE responses are not acceptable nor accountable responses to the district taxpayers and parents. An in school return plan can be safely enacted. I would refer you to the study that DeSmet is doing for their school reentry plan and safety protocol for when COVID affects their buildings. I encourage you to, you to not let the teachers' unions or politicians silence what is right, therefore, thereby allowing this to be the political, be political using our children as pawns. Children are the ones ultimately suffering from this, both educationally and mentally. They are not merely incon inconvenienced, they are suffering. But stop failing them. Please stop failing them. Do not be scared of what the media will say about Rockwood. Three quarters of Rockwood parents want to go back in person and will support you through this focus. Focus on your children, your parents, and not media backlash. The media is toxic and holds no relevance to public opinion anymore. I will continue to speak up for my children, encourage them to advocate for their future. I hope you can do this too for my kids and for all district kids. Respectfully, Rich Mueller. Patron comment number 19, 
Thank you for providing this forum to express concerns and ask questions. First of all, I wish all teachers and staff of the district the best year and hope everyone can stay safe and healthy. Can there be some elaboration on the high school plan of quarter system classes? I have a high school junior, which is arguably the, the most important year, or at least that's what she tells me through her tears as she talks about it this year. And I don't understand how the best option was to give her only half of her semester classes each quarter. We always worry about the summer slide, but this seems scarier. She and I are both concerned about this, but this seemed to be our most urgent concern and question. How is How was this decided to be the best option, keeping students' best interest for education in mind? Thanks, Matt Howell. Patron comment number 20, dear Mr. Miles and the school board, I beg you to keep politics out of your decision in getting these kids back to school. If that were the case, these kids would be in school. You have many parents in your district, like myself, struggling with kids being at home learning. Please let me know how I am going to get three elementary kids through a virtual school day in which one can't even read and yet take care, care, care of a two-year-old at the same time. I can tell you it's not going to happen. I also have other obligations in my life there will be times in which my elementary age kids will be on their own to learn. My kids will miss Zoom calls. They will fall behind in their studies. Basically, you can't afford private schools. Your kids will fall behind. My kids have been home six months now, and I am struggling emotionally. They ask me every day if the schools have changed their minds and will let them come back. Schools are over, all over the country are going back. Please follow the numbers and not make this political. My children need to be back in school. And that's signed by Michelle Swifel. Patron comment number 21, Rockwood School Board. I don't know how many parents have to continuously show their dire passion and need for kids to return to school without feeling heard, but here we are again. The situation you have put the families of this district in is beyond frustrating and downright careless on your part. As a parent in a dual working household, I'm appalled at the lack of compassion for the families in the district. I have three elementary age students, three. How in the world exactly do you expect my husband and I to continue to work our jobs that allow us to afford the elevated cost of living in the Rockwood School District also while leading our children during online learning? While I know a large portion of you are well past elementary age children in your life, please, please, please remember most of us aren't. I am now forced by each of you to come up with over $2,000 a month for my children to be virtually taught and accommodate your lack of planning and efforts with now full-time remote learning. Your previous communication stated that the lack of staff available to teach hybrid learning was the reason that option didn't work, yet I saw no job post posting seeking staff. In fact, I learned you were turning away substitutes. So then what was it really? Was it a budget issue? If yes, you should be ashamed of yourselves demanding families to go well over their personal budgets or worse, make the choice between a career and their children's education because you didn't want to work hard to figure out a solution. The financial strife you're putting on elementary families is in, in is being ignored and yet adds to the burden of your decision. I, for the first time, am ashamed to be part of the Rockwood family. This is not a family. A family looks out for one another and does whatever it takes. You have not taken that away from our kids and our, you have taken that away from our kids and our community. Please look at all the data, the real data, not the political data. We are safe to return to school. Cases don't equal deaths. Our hospitals are not overrun. Compare the numbers to the annual flu and ask yourself, why are we denying our children an impersonal education they need without a significant danger? Be bold and stand up for what's right. Thank you, Karen Hockenberry. Patron comment number 22 to the Rockwoods Board of Education. I am a Rockwood parent of sixth grader and a second grader. I'm writing in regards to the current school year plan and the virtual learning platform, as well as my, con my concern with what the plan is for reopening the schools. I work full time and because of all the restrictions, I am having to pay money to send my son to a facility that will help him with his asynchronous learning. That's an extra $600 a month. What is the district's plan for reopening? What are the requirements for re reopening? And are, are you hiring more teachers at the time in order to prepare for a possible reopening? Also, my daughter doesn't even have math until late October. Why is math not incorporated in each term for middle school? I would really appreciate more transparency from the district so that I know what to expect and what the various scenarios look like if and when the schools reopen. Thank you, Veronica Cleaver. Patron comment number 23. My name is Stacy Kasparik, and I had 
a 10th grader at Eureka. My daughter has had a big college goal since before high school and worked very hard to, to achieve a 4.14 grade point average last year. When I heard that school is not going to be five days, I was concerned how this would affect her education. I realize these are uncharted times, but I'm okay with our kids being used as guinea pigs. Then came the news of the, the quarter system, shoving that much information in at the high school level with several weeks between first and second semester classes is ridiculous. It is not setting our children up to succeed. It's not giving them the education Rockwood has promised. These kids depend on this knowledge for test scores and GPAs for college acceptance. Their future is at risk, risk and Rockwood is failing them. Then came the preposterous scheduled seven hour school day with several Zoom meetings each day. This is absurd on so many levels, but I'm go not going to discuss how Rockwood is failing other families. I'm going to address how it failed mine. We live in rural Eureka. When my daughter went on the ALP last spring, we were given a hotspot, which did nothing to help. My daughter was never able to participate in Zooms. The second I found out Rockwood was going full viral, I reached out to the IT department. They never called me back. Next, I reached out to the sophomore principal who said he would search for a solution. I emailed Tom Minicello, explained how my daughter couldn't use Zoom and the best he could do is ask for teachers to record her classes. She would still be expected to attempt to join the Zooms, but if or rather when it didn't work, she could watch it later. That means she is responsible for being in front of the computer for seven hours a day, only to have to spend hours later rewatching lessons and then doing the homework and projects in isolation. Rockwood's page at the moment boasts that Rockwood's online system will provide direct instruction, small group facilitation, and individual conferencing. These things are all unavailable to our daughter. On that note, Rockwood also boasts providing all students access to a broad range of educational opportunities. At this point, Rockwood has literally removed removing her opportunities. She needs to be in school to receive the education that will set her up for the college success. School starts in four days. My daughter is scheduled for four advanced classes. Rockwood has completely failed our family. My daughter has big goals, goals she was proud to be carrying out at Rockwood, not anymore. The damage of Rockwood's decisions will be long lasting and not forgotten in this community. Stacy Kasparsik. Patron comment number 24, dear board members and Dr. Miles, I'm writing this email to encourage the district to put forth pu pu publicly the guidelines that will be used to determine when our kids can get back to school, in, to school, to in school learning. I'm not here to debate data or reiterate the recommendations by multiple agencies about getting kids back to school anymore. All that I'm asking is that we are told what needs to happen to get our kids back in school at a minimum of twice per week with the hope of returning to an in-person learning five days a week. I know there is a teacher shortage. I realize that's a real concern. How are we planning to address that situation? I've talked to several teachers, all of whom would like to get back into the classroom. And one thing that keeps popping up in the conversation is that they were not asked whether they could, would come back or not if the district forced them or if the district forced them to make a decision. I was presented more I was presented more as what their preference would be at this time. I would argue that when push comes to shove, many preferences might end up changing if your alternative was being furloughed or replaced. When businesses don't have enough employees to run efficiently, they hire more workers. If we are at the point where our school district cannot operate efficiently and provide us the choice to educate our children in person, then maybe we need to figure out how to hire more teachers and incentivize the ones that are willing to teach in the classroom. Another option for the schools, for the high schools, would be to start consolidating class options. One of the great things about the district is the vast enormity of the choices for classes. At this point, if we can't staff all of the options, maybe we should look at getting rid of some of them. My daughter is in four AP classes, but if I had the choice of having her back in school and taking fewer than four or even zero, that would be my choice. If we have to reduce class options so that we can staff accordingly, then maybe that's something that to consider at this critical point in time. Bottom line is I just want to know what is the data is that will be driving the decision to get kids back in schools. If it's not about data and safety and COVID at this point, but it's lack of teachers, then I would like to know what the plan is for solving that problem because ignoring it and hoping it resolves itself on its own is not going to happen. And right now our kids are the ones suffering from this injustice. Regards, signed Marla Fastenau. And patron comment number 25. My name is Tanvi Karen, and I'm writing to you this morning in hopes of my, that my voice being heard. I'm a former Rockwood student 
graduating from Rockwood Summit in 1999. Fast forward 21 years, I now have three children also in Rockwood, grades kindergarten, first and fourth. My husband and I, also a Rockwood student graduating from Eureka in 1995, moved to Rockwood District in 2015 because we wanted to provide our children the same quality education and care we received when we were students. We sold our house in Fox School District five years ago, bought a house in Rockwood, and are paying an incredible amount of taxes to support our school district. We wanted Rockwood more than anything to give our children the same education that didn't fail us and provided us with successful, successful time in college and the reason why we have our careers. Unfortunately, going virtual isn't going to provide my children the same quality education. I'm a full-time employee, as is my husband. We don't have a choice but to work full-time so that we can provide for our home and pay for our home and the property taxes behind it. Now you're not at no, you're not a daycare establishment, and I understand that, but my children need to be back in school so that I can work outside of my home. My children do not need to be behind a computer screen. They need social interaction with their peers. They need education being taught face-to-face -face by our talented teachers. This is overall going to affect my children and so many others if you decide to remain 100% virtual for the remainder of the semester and possibly the year. We are going to be so far behind many other children in St. Louis County and Missouri who have got a choice of going to school, whether they're in a public school district or a private school. For the teachers who are scared about going back, give them the option of resigning and finding another job and give their position to teachers who just graduated. They would be fine candidates for the job and I feel confident in saying that they could teach our children way better than many of the parents that are in the same situation. I appreciate your time and hope your thoughts hope my thoughts can help you all see that this isn't about me this is about the kids we have a lot of kids in the district who can't be home luckily my kids are privileged to be in a safe and loving home with all of the food and internet access in the world but we can't guarantee all of the kids in our district can say the same think about that issue as well thank you tan v karen and that is the last patron comment mrs sadowski Thank you from the bottom of my heart for reading all 20. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, superintendent board comments. We'll start with our superintendent, Dr. Mark Miles. Thank you, Mrs. Mondal. A few comments uh, this evening. Uh, first, last week, Rockwood School District, well, welcomed approximately 70 new teachers for the 2020-2021 school year. We held virtual orientation last Thursday to kick off a four-day span of training opportunities hosted by the district's professional learning team via Canvas and Zoom conferences. Our new teachers were encouraged to collaborate with their fellow educators through thinking exercises, activities, and various breakout sessions. I would uh, like to thank the Director of Learning Development, Dr. Renee Trotier, and Coordinator for Professional Learning, Donette Whisker, for their leadership in providing a first-class event for our new teachers. We're excited to welcome this fine group of educators to Rockwood. They'll have a unique experience to begin the year, without a doubt. Two Rockwood physical education teachers have been recognized by MoShape, the Missouri Society of Health and Physical Educators for Excellence in Teaching. Crestview Middle Schools, Dr. Katie Severson has been named the MoShape State Teacher of the Year, and Ridge Meadows Elementary's Katie Royce has been named the MoShape District Elementary Teacher of the Year for 2020. Our PE teachers play a vital role in the education, health, and wellness of our children. And these two are prime examples of the dedicated, talented teachers we enjoy in Rockwood. On that note, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Marquette High School science teacher, Dr. Kathy Farrar, who has been named one of 15 semifinalists for State Teacher of the Year by the Missouri Department of Secondary, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. The finalists will be announced on August 27th. And we certainly wish Dr. Farrar well as she continues to represent Rockwood exceptionally throughout the process. Thinking of transportation, the Rockwood Transportation Department earned a 98.9% approval rate from the Missouri State Highway Patrol in its annual school bus inspection results. Rockwood ensures its fleet of 191 buses is up to Department of Public Safety standards at a rate that outpaces the statewide average of 89.1%. 
I'd like to commend Director of Transportation, Mike Heyman and his team for the wonderful service they perform in maintaining the vehicles that we rely upon to transport our students to and from school safely and efficiently. Rockwood Child Nutrition Services is providing a valuable service to Rockwood families. Nutritious breakfast and lunch meals is grab and go options that are available for every student. Packages will be available for curbside pickup every Monday and Wednesday morning from 8 to 10 a.m. at Crestview, LaSalle Springs, Rockwood South, and Selvage Middle Schools. The reservation deadline is every Thursday morning at 10 a.m. for the following week. Students who qualify for free meals will receive the grab and go meals at no charge, while students who qualify for reduced meal benefits will be charged a reduced price. Please visit the Child Nutrition Services page on our district website for more information on the program and how families can reserve their meals. And Monday, August 24th marks the start of the school year in Rockwood. This first day of school has, um, and every first day of school has always been one of my favorite days of the year. It's a time to build connections, a time when students meet their teachers and those trusted educators and staff members who will guide them uh, and teach them in the coming year. Although our school year will begin differently than we would have hoped, be assured that we remain committed, helping our students learn and grow in the coming months. Rockwood teachers and staff members work during the summer to build a robust online curriculum and we're excited learners through our Rockwood online offerings. In this video that you're about to see, Brian Reed, coordinator of STEM and digital learning, and three Rockwood teachers take parents and students through the innovation that went into creating these online courses. Let's watch. Canvas is a learning management system. So it's the system we're using for pre-K all the way through 12th grade to house all of the learning activities, all of the lessons, all of the videos, all of the assignments, the assessments. You know, when parents get in and start seeing not just the quality, but the interaction piece that they're going to be able to have with their, with their peers and with the teachers. It truly becomes this, this remarkable form of education. When you log into Canvas, the first thing you'll be greeted with is your dashboard. On that dashboard, you'll see a series of tiles, and each one of those tiles is a course that the students have been rostered to. Once you're in, um, then you are greeted by this really beautiful landing page that has been customized for every content, every grade level. From there, you'll see a series of buttons. At the elementary level, they look more like apps that you would find on a phone or a tablet. And so from there, that leads the students through a, a navigation process. They can click on a button to be directed to the lessons. They can click on another button to be directed, directed to district resources. They can click on another button to be directed to the messaging system that Canvas offers, or there's a button for the calendar feature, and there's a button for the announcements. And so um, there's even a button on there we built in purposely for parents, because again, parents and other stakeholders are a big part of this online learning process. And so we've developed some resources strictly for parents on how they can work in tandem with their children at home and support the learning at home without having to know the content. I'm really excited about Canvas actually, because um, we will have all of our curriculum online in one place and it'll be really easy to um, give it out to the kids and the families. Um, and I also think that like with all of that work that's already done for us on Canvas, it'll open up a lot more time for us to really interact with students and help them with anything they have trouble with. Um, and we can build relationships and have some fun and I can help them out instead of being worried about putting all my curriculum online. Um, so I think what Rockwood's doing is creating a situation where kids can learn and kids can wonder at home and imagine about things and explore their learning in a guided situation that's personal to them by using teachers' voices and teachers' explanations from the district. It's been a lot of fun actually trying to figure out ways to bring the classroom into the homes of the students. In my development of classes, it's really been about how can I put this material in the hands of the students and then let me be the one who just fills in the blanks. There has been a lot of thought and a lot of effort that has gone into making sure that this is different, but it's good. And we're gonna do what we do best, and that is take care of your kids and teach what we love. 
and we just can't wait for the opportunity to do that. Great video. We look forward to seeing uh, those services on Monday. So finally this evening, I want to provide just a, a brief update related to our planning efforts to allow our students to return to school for in-person educational services five days per week. We've continued our regular collaboration with superintendents, medical professionals, and healthcare professionals during the past few months, and we're going to continue to do so. I would say without a doubt, this situation continues to be personally and professionally frustrating and disappointing. And I think we would likely all agree with that. While there are no specific uh, community health indicators that provide clarity on our return to school five days per week, I wanted to provide the Board of Education and our community with an understanding of four health indicators uh, we are assessing daily. Uh, I commend Dr. Matt Goodman, Dr. Paul Ziegler, and our partners at Education Plus for their work to compile and provide us with this information related to four key community health indicators. Regional transmission rate, test positivity rate, the seven-day average of new daily case rates, and 14-day comparison of changes in new cases. Those are really the four key indicators that uh, superintendents and I have narrowed in on that we will examine on a daily basis. And so Matt Goodman is providing us with that data. We will look at trends and we hope that those trends are extremely positive. So we're actively monitoring the transmission rate in St. Louis County with a target, of course, below 1.0. Uh, that would signify a reduction in the spread of the virus. As we think back to June 3rd, the transmission rate in St. Louis County was 0.78. On June 10th, it was 0.87. As we look at the transmission rate today in St. Louis County, it stands at 1.61. We're also monitoring the test positivity rate with a target of less than 5%. The current test positivity rate is at 8.3%. We're assessing the seven-day average of new cases per 100,000 citizens with a target of below 10. Of course, we'd love it to be zero. Uh, we'd love a target of below one, but we think a target of below 10 is reasonable. The current seven-day average of new cases per 100,000 citizens is approximately 26. And we're also examining the 14-day comparison of the change in new cases with our preference, of course, for declining numbers. According to the latest data provided by Education Plus, from August 4th through the 17th, new cases increased 24.3%. So we wanted to provide this information uh, to you so that all may track and trend our progress uh, as a community. Uh, I really wanna ask our community to take the necessary steps to improve these numbers because it is simply up to us our children absolutely belong in our schools and improving these health indicators is going to provide the greatest likelihood of getting our children back to school and achieve that goal of getting our children back to school. So Dr. Goodman is going to continue to provide us uh, with that data and those numbers. These are the same numbers that a variety of superintendents in St. Louis County uh, are monitoring. Uh, we've been asked several times about those specific metrics. Uh, our healthcare professionals are hesitant to clearly define this is the set of metrics. Although in our discussions with them, we've identified these four as key indicators. Uh, so I'll be providing the board uh, during these meetings with regular updates related to these four uh, key indicators. So just wanted to uh, finalize uh, that this evening with my comments to know that we are tracking these health metrics. Of course, there may be opinions about other health metrics that we should be tracking and trending, but in our work with St. Louis County, as well as other healthcare and medical professionals, we've narrowed in on these four. That is all I have this evening. Thank you, Dr. Miles. Any board comments? I have one quick comment. 
Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the early childhood staff who invited us to their, uh, to come out to central office this week. Uh, Director Miller, myself and Dr. Miles were there and we just wanted to say thank you for that. And we really appreciate the recognition and the kindness that was shown to all of us that day. They surprised us with a parade and it was just very touching, very heartfelt and much needed for all of us. I know those of you who weren't able to be there in person were able to see some pictures and see some things that they prepared for us. And so I just wanna take a minute to publicly thank them because it really meant a lot to see all those smiling and supportive faces in person. Thank you, Director Bays, anyone else? All right, so let's move on, uh, along. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda items as submitted. So moved. Second. We have motion and a second. Any discussion? Everybody's good? Jamie? Yeah, I just said. Uh, yeah, I need to abstain from 7.02, please. Okay, otherwise we're good. All right, so the motion is to approve the consent agenda items as submitted. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. All right, we're moving on to agenda items. 8.01, professional development presentation. Dr. Renee Trotier and Donette Whisker. You are up. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can drive presentation. So can you all see the presentation at this time? Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, we just thought we would just take a minute and recap summer learning briefly, share how we're supporting teachers this week. And then we wanted to let the board know what the plan is for the full day professional learning. So um, this is my what, 27th year in Rockwood. And for the first 26, we had those eight half days throughout the year where uh, students were dismissed halfway through. And then last year, um, the board approved a plan where we had four full days in place of those eight half days. So I just wanted to talk about what the plan was for those days. Um, so this summer, um, all of our professional learning really is connected to uh, the first three goal areas of the way forward. Um, so we had um, topics on um, the student academic learning. There was a lot of curriculum writing for online um, courses, as you're aware. Um, we had Canvas training and other technology training, as well as a lot of training on online teaching strategies, engaging students with brain-based strategies, mental health first aid, um, and other uh, social emotional support. I was going to have Donette Whisker um, talk a little bit about um, the modeling that took place for um, virtual learning. Thank you. So one thing that spring showed us was that we really had to be ready for anything come summer. And we also, um, a tenant of the pro professional learning department for many years is that, you know, we want to model and kind of walk the walk and talk the talk. And so we really wanted to make sure that we provided teachers with um, both asynchronous learning in Canvas. We actually had a lot of positive feedback from that. Teachers could work on that learning on their own time. We also did um, synchronous learning through Zoom. So we modeled how to keep um, people engaged and interact with participants in a Zoom call. And so um, then even at the end of summer, we did some modeling of some in-person, kind of a hybrid model where we met in person maybe for part of a day with social distancing and mask. And then the um, participants participated via Canvas and other means later on. Renee, you're muted. You need to unmute. Thank you. That helps. Um, on, a, on, a, <laughs> on a side note, um, we, we did feel a little bit more connected, actually, to our participants at the end of the summer 
um, because the online learning, particularly the asynchronous learning in Canvas allowed us to have um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one dialogue um, with participants, whereas when we do our teaching in person, they might be doing an activity and we might be working around the room, but we don't get quite as much um, one-on-one, -on -one, we also found teachers willing to be a little more vulnerable um, in a one-on-one -on -one environment when they would submit reflections and a little bit more thoughtful. And so that gave us hope um, for what our students will experience um, in the virtual learning environment um, as they return this fall. Um, we did actually have more participants than, than we've had in the last five years anyway. Um, we had 194 total workshops. Our five-year average is 159 from the last five years. We had close to 5,000 uh, participants. We typically have around 3,000. Um, unique participants, That's we, we had 1,400. We typically have 1,300. So that number was a little bit closer. We do have about 1,500 certified staff in Rockwood. So um, teachers, we really found um, things filled up and we worked with the technology folks um, that were doing a lot of presenting and our curriculum folks. And anytime something was full, we just found a way um, to get all the teachers in that wanted um, that particular learning. So we were um, scrambling to get them in and really appreciate um, a lot of these workshops are taught by curriculum facilitators and coordinators, instructional technology specialists, um, as well as uh, professional learning and some teachers. And so we appreciated the flexibility of the presenter so that we can meet the needs of all the teachers that were um, wanting to learn um, what they could prior to school starting. Uh, Dr. Miles already talked about new teacher orientation. This uh, picture sure um, they sure look serious in this photo that was captured by Andrew Shin, um, but I promise we did uh, model a lot of fun activities for them. Um, as Dr. Miles mentioned, we, we did work through modeling for them what instruction should look like in Canvas and what it should look like um, in Zoom as well as instructor presence, which is a really important part of um, virtual learning um, that te teachers, kids feel connected to their instructor. Um, and then uh, this week, we actually have um, learning going on in a few different ways. So we have self-paced learning for teachers. The principals have given them additional time for their learning and have reduced the number of building meetings that they have so that they have some time um, to go through uh, the self-paced learning that we provided for them on curriculum and pacing, online instruction, technology support, and meeting the needs, uh, social emotional needs of their students in a virtual environment. Um, we also have technology training, uh, primarily focusing on Canvas at this time, um, as well as curriculum support as their curriculum materials, materials are rolled out um, in the virtual format. And then finally, I, this is really new information for you. Um, and that is, you know, if you recall last year, we had the eight full days in the past and then the new calendar, sorry, the eight half days, the new calendar reflects four uh, full days of professional learning. There's an additional full day. It, it's not on this chart. That's September 8th. Um, September 8th, students are dismissed for a full day of professional learning. And that's actually the curriculum uh, day that is typically uh, delivered during this week. So that is a curriculum day for all of our K-12 staff uh, where they can also get additional support um, after they've worked for a few weeks with online learning. It'll be a perfect time for them to get support in curriculum and technology um, to make sure that to help them uh, even deliver their curriculum more effectively in the online environment. Um, but the other four days, um, looks like three of them are Mondays and then Friday, the 12th is a Friday before, um, before the holiday weekend. And these dates were really chosen by professional learning, uh, the professional development committee, as well as the calendar committee that's run by the human resources department. And um, they were made to be Mondays and Fridays for the convenience of families. And if you take a look on here, this is a middle school schedule. The schedule is a little bit different for elementary and high school and early childhood to meet their needs. So um, if you look at anything that's yellow is just building time. Anything that is blue is curriculum time. And then the green is the part that I want to talk about. These are strands connected to the way forward. So to help um, us move forward as a district. And so the original plan was for teachers to choose one pathway and stick with that pathway as a cohort um, with opportunities for college credit for um, completing that cohort together. Um, we, we're probably going to have to adjust that a little bit so that we can make sure there is additional needs come up if teachers have additional needs in technology um, or curriculum support in this first semester. We may need to make some adjustments um, and give teachers some options 
um, to not be necessarily in a full, a full day, a four, um, a four day strand. Uh, so this schedule was developed by the professional development committee, including the um, NEA, SSD representatives, as well as principal representatives from every level uh, based on surveys of all of our staff and um, building principal needs. It took a year to develop that schedule. Um, outcomes will be connected to the teacher evaluation instrument as well as the way forward we'll be doing some um, competency-based professional learning. Um, again, those strands are connected to the way forward, the, the top three goals and whether we're virtual or whether we're in person, um, all of these pieces are still essential for our kids. So some of our topics are, of course, designing and planning online and blended learning, uh, project-based learning, assessment, developing assessment capable learners, engaging students and reinvigorating teachers, powerful PLC work, uh, cultural proficiency, restorative practices, meeting the needs of special populations, mental health first aids, behavioral support, and alive and well STL trauma institute. So all of those are still relevant in, um, in our current environment. And that's all we had, unless you have any questions. Thank you, any questions? Okay, no, I moving right along. Thank no, you. I, oh. well, I didn't. So, Renee, would you reiterate um, something that Brian said earlier in the little video clip that A, we've been training teachers on Canvas and they've had lots of opportunities, one, to be trained and then to go back and go through some of these modules again. Is that correct? So, there there's basically different levels of training. So like our elementary is in a little bit different place than the secondary. And so secondary has been, has had optional access for quite some time. What's new, the curriculum that was being written this summer is really high quality curriculum that really took a lot of time to write. And so the teachers really are seeing that, um, that, that well, I take that back. The curriculum coordinators have been communicating with teachers all summer, but teachers aren't under contract. So we can't, we can't guarantee that everyone's had training until this week. However, the interest has been so high. And um, like I said, we've had 1,400 unique participants. We have 1,500 certified staff. So the, um, you know, the interest has been very, very high. So they have all been trained by the time that school starts. Um, however, the people that were in the video are people that were writing the curriculum. And so they've had very deep training and um, we've been working with their colleagues. And did we not have Canvas last year though? Canvas is not new to this year. Correct, Canvas is not new. Right. Uh, however, in the spring, um, we really heard from our, it wasn't required for teachers to use. And in the spring, we heard from our families that they were getting all of these emails and trying to find all these different ways. Some teachers were using Canvas. Some teachers are um, sending emails through Infinite Campus Messenger. Some teachers were using Rockwood email. Some teachers were using Google Classroom. And so um, parents needed a one-stop shop place to go. So our teachers knew before they left this summer that there would be an expectation to use those communication modules of Canvas for sure. And one last question. And uh, Brian, again, Brian had referred to this, but there is a, a, an access for parents to Canvas to see some of these lessons and a curriculum so that they can support their children at home. Is that correct? Yeah, and, how are we and how are we communicating that to parents? I might let Shelly answer that. It looks like Shelly, that you need to do that, but it's called a parent observer status. And that's one of the advantages of the Canvas um, student information system is uh -huh. it allows parents to see um, part of that, uh, what the students can see, but they can't submit assignments if that makes right, sense. Right, right. But they can observe and see some of the activities and see what their child is learning. Correct. And I'm going to let Shelly answer your question about communication. Okay. So they can see everything that the student would see in the class, like Renee said. Um, the communication for that is coming from the buildings. Um, we also have something on our district website. Um, we really are encouraging teachers to reach out and buildings to reach out to make that first connection with parents about here's the school year, here's how you can get your observer account. But all of that information is on our website and we automatically have accounts set up for the primary address on Infinite Campus. So that person will have a very easy way of getting in. And then there are directions on there if additional people want to sign on as observers. That's good to know. Thank you for directing us, Shelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Next up, I need a motion to approve the bond issue purchases and related contracts, seventy-five hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, as submitted. So moved. I have a man. Do, do we have a second? Second. All right, and we have a second. Hey, Deb, go ahead, please. This purchase is just simply to replace the projector in A100. Uh, we've had a lot of issues with it over the last year, and it's been replaced under warranty. It's no longer under warranty. That was the recommendation from the manufacturer is that it would be So that is what we're doing. Okay. Any questions for Deb? All right. So that motion is to approve purchases and related contracts. All those in. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? You guys did that in tears. I, 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 I. 0.03 proposed agenda for the September 3rd, 2020 Board of Education meeting. <clears throat> okay. Anybody have anything to add or any questions about that? Okay. Future 9.01, future agenda presentations and events to attend. Uh, just a reminder, as we all know, Monday, August 24th, 2020 is the first day of school for our students. Uh, Dr. Miles, I'm assuming you will be in our schools on that day. I think I saw something that you had sent us. I will be making a tour of all of our facilities, uh, touching base with our administrators, teachers in the buildings, and um, practicing all the appropriate mitigation strategies, but looking forward to a tour of buildings over five days. Excellent. Appreciate you doing that for our kids. Uh, anyone else have anything to add to events or presentations? All right, if there's nothing else, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. See you all later. Okay,